welcome to the It's Time to Sell podcast with your host, Chris Spurvey. Chris is dedicated to mentoring entrepreneurs and sales professionals through the fear of selling so they can confidently bring their product or service to market. Here's your host, Chris Spurvey. Okay. All right. Well, why don't we just... I'm not going to watch it on Facebook because it's the delay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an eight second delay. It's like a bad Japanese movie. <laughs> All you see is me being dubbed. We, we, we just need Godzilla to come in the background. <laughs> oh my, we've had a wild start. We, we're, we're 15 minutes now trying to figure out uh, Zoom and, and Zoom is great, but uh, trying to figure out how to get this whole thing working and, and moving mm-hmm. forward. But Ron, uh, welcome to the It's Time to Sell podcast. I'm grateful for you taking the time. And I should also note we're live on Facebook uh, through my Make Sales a Habit uh, page. And uh, yeah, thanks for taking the time. Great to be with you, Chris. Yeah, this is awesome. So, I mean, why don't we get started uh, as I typically get most of my shows started. Tell the audience uh, who you are and a little bit about your background and we'll kind of go from there, I guess. Yeah, so I get to spend my days at my firm called Nabilent, uh working alongside leaders of all kinds and sizes. And most of them are in the throes of some very significant transformation. They're trying to get from some point A to some point B, whether that's growth or out of a ditch or through some major organizational or cultural change um, that they either imposed on the organization themselves or was imposed on them. Um, and the, the tumultuousness, the turbulence of that journey often requires all kinds of help. And we get to go partner with them along the way and help them not only just not hurt themselves, but hopefully thrive and help their organizations grow and succeed and reach some, some set of aspirations that uh, they otherwise might have not found. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so it sounds to me like you get to experience something new almost every day, hey? Uh, it's an, it's definitely a new story every day. It's never yeah. boring. Yeah, yeah. And so out of curiosity, what brought you to this point in your journey, uh, you know, uh, where you're now, you're, you know, you're the owner uh, of your own business, you're leading a, leading a company, doing these things, doing some of this consulting work. Um, you know, what brought you to this point in, in, your, in your career? Well, so Navalin, uh, there are three of us that sort of spearhead up the firm. We started Navalin 13 years ago. Um, we were all, some of us were working at a much larger consulting firm and we're passionate about what we do. We love organizations. We love uh, the human side of change. I think I've been fascinated by how, how human endeavor is organized since I was a kid. You know, if, if there was a stickball game to be organized, if there was a fundraiser to be organized, if there was a, some event that had to be brought together, that's where I thrived. Mm. So I think, you know, humans coming together to, to do something they couldn't do alone has always been an, a, a natural fascination for me. I think I learned early on in my career after being part of large organizations that if I was going to live out my passion for organizations, it was probably going to be by not having to be part of one. <laughs> <laughs> because the political dynamics for truth telling, the, 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 the scurvy waters of what does it mean to hold up a mirror to leaders um, doesn't don't go so well when you're an insider. I mean, ancient wisdom said you can't be a prophet in your own land. And I think I learned that to be true. Yeah. And so my, my best contribution to my passion for organizations was going to have to be as an outsider. Mm. So um, we all worked for this wonderful firm in New York city that got by bought by a much larger firm. And, you know, as you get smaller mid-sized firms get swallowed up, it becomes the focus shifts, right? It becomes about just keeping the machine fed. And I think we all felt like our passion for the work, uh, for being in the trenches with executives and CEOs, you know, at the helm of really exciting change uh, was too much fun to give up um, for just selling and feeding a machine and not doing it. And so we said, we can go do this ourselves. And so we decided to start an Avalent. 13 years ago and have had a wonderful, exciting run ever since. Yeah. It's hard to, believe, it's hard to believe we're 13 when we look so young. I mean, I, you know, I started Neville when I was five. So that's why. <laughs> I can relate to that's a lot. The, that's the explanation. People I'm yeah. sure is wondering, how did they do that? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. Yeah. I, I, uh, I can relate to everything you're saying, uh, interestingly enough. Uh, so I, I uh, helped grow a uh, consulting company. Uh, and in 2013, we decided to be acquired by KPMG. 
uh, in Canada. And I spent four years as vice president of business development for KPMG Canada. And um, I guess I came to the realization shortly after the acquisition that, uh, you know, my passion uh, was for serving the entrepreneur. And I, I struggled within such a large, uh, complex organization to do that, which brought me down my journey to write my book. And, and, uh, and I, I guess I, I, my dream came true, I suppose, uh, mid last year when I jumped out on my own. Uh, and left the uh, left the safe, secure job to do my own thing. So I can relate to your journey for sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I'm curious uh, because you come from that consulting background, uh, you know, and and some of the work you're doing with small businesses today. What what is your take on the word sales? Uh, you know, what does it mean to you? Uh, how does it make you feel? And and how does it make your clients feel? Out of curiosity, you know, it's I mean. You know, I think Dan Pink said it well, to sell as human, right? Mm. Um, I, I, when you're a small business, it's, that word, um, it's hard to put that word in isolation, right? Yeah. A broader suite yeah. of demand creation, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, he's one of the guests on our virtual summit. Um, oh, wow. I interviewed him for his, his new book, When. He's such a good yeah. guy. Yeah, he is. Yeah. But you can't isolate the selling transaction apart from a, a, a suite of demand creating mechanisms, right? Whether it's, um, whether it's um, your digital footprint, social media, content marketing, you know, how you create a presence, how you create a draw, how you build a funnel of, you know, from people who don't even know who you are to people who are converting to clients or, or customers. Um, it, you can't separate just a, most people don't do direct sales these days, right? It's just not, you know, if you're in retail, if you're in services, you, you, the way you're drawing people to you is usually not out pounding the pavement, knocking on doors and seeing people because mm. most people are selling a service or a knowledge or an idea. They're not selling a product. Right. And so, and I'm living it now as a small business owner, you know, we relate to the game when it comes to demand creation, we're, we're learning ourselves. What does it mean to build a platform of influence, to build, to set yourself apart you know, the world changed for us. When we were doing organizational consulting and leadership consulting back in the day, it was not a formidable, you know, there wasn't a lot of competition. Now, you know, 13 years later, there are thousands, literally registered firms, thousands of small boutiques doing what, claiming to do what we do with yeah. in the same language we use, all with ideas they're trying to purvey. Um, forget about the hundreds of thousands of solopreneurs doing it by themselves. Mm. So to set yourself apart uh, in that sea of noise um, and let the otherwise uninformed prospect select you from among you know, what looks to be the same. Yeah. Um, wow. That's a whole new game. And we're, we're still learning. You know, we're, we're about three years in now to a very intentional and intensive demand creation um, platform building effort as a firm. And it's, man, it's hard. I, I, two years ago, I hired a coach. Um, I thought I, at this point in my career, I, I'm out of my depth here. Yeah. I, I've written eight books. I'm publishing. I'm doing what I, I'm doing my part. At least I think yeah. I'm doing my part. Yeah. And it, I don't, and it's not working. Mm. And I went and hired my own coach to say, what, what is it too late? Maybe it's just too late. <laughs> um, um, and I had I hired a, an amazing coach. I think she's been a guest on your show, Dory Clark. Oh yeah, of course. And wow, what a rocket ride that's been. Yeah, um, my God, what a phenomenal individual to have uh, mentoring you. She's yeah. uh, she's been instrumental in my process. Uh, I, I she hasn't coached me directly, but uh, she's been on my podcast twice. And her book, Stand Out, was the yeah. blueprint I used to grow my brand. Yep. Um. Um. And so. Anyway, it's now now here we are in our third year together, yeah. um, and it's a it's a it's a new game. Yeah, it's still hard, and it's not. There's no no such thing as an overnight sensation, but um, but it, but it's been a, a tremendous learning journey. But yeah, it uh, for small businesses and entrepreneurs who are trying to create scale, um, it's a it's not an easy um, it's not an easy ride. 
No, no. And so where does the human element uh, come into your sales process today versus say back in when you were, uh, you know, swallow, like I'm just reflecting on your journey, what the sales look like now versus what it looked like back before our opportunities to differentiate ourselves through content, through writing books, through being on podcasts and so on. I mean, uh, do you find the human to human element comes in at a later stage than it used to? Well, uh, so I don't know that there's ever not a human element, right? I think the the, the minute your your digital footprint dehumanizes the work, um, then you're, you're just blending into the the screen, right? Yeah. So you've got to keep, you've got to find a way to keep your presence, to keep your personality, to keep who you are, you know, in some form of your voice at the forefront of yeah. whatever, whatever spear you're aiming at a marketplace to draw the right clients to you, the right customers to you. you if, if it's not the uniqueness of you, mm. uh, and your unique passion for who it is you're aiming at that leads that messaging and that experience, then it doesn't matter. Then you just like, yeah. you might as well just go get a billboard and no hair. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, and that therein lies the challenge, right? I mean, so video can help with that when it's a human, but, but bl- a blending an integrated set of mechanisms that are your voice um, is the hard part. And you know, the biggest detriment to that, Chris, that I see small businesses struggle with is they don't even know who they are. Yeah. When I ask them, tell me your strategy. Tell me why you exist. Why would somebody choose you over all the other people doing what you do? I get the business plan. I get mm. the, the Series B funding sheet, term sheets. I get a mission statement or a vision statement. I get the values. I get all these counterfeits that um, feel so good to create. Uh, I put up on a, on a wall or a screensaver or you know put on a mug. Um, but I don't get an identity. I don't right. get a sense of... What are the fundamental capabilities that differentiate you that you're putting all your money in disproportionately because you believe a dollar in gets you five hours back mm. um, that, that, that would cause the people you want to serve to choose you over somebody else and they haven't done the work. Right. When, with strategy, they say, oh, well, that's for big companies. We're too small. We don't, you know, we, we're just a heating and plumbing company or we're just a, a, a small digital marketing company or and the elements of strategy, the fundamental are more important when you're smaller yes. than when you're, um, because that's when people don't know who you are. That's when you're an untested, unknown. And so if you can't do the fundamental work of really chopping your field, and then the hardest part for most entrepreneurs is learning to say no. Mm. Not all revenue is created equal. Not all margin is created equal. Not all customers are created equal. And if you cannot distinguish what is your swim lane that you're going to stay in and not Costco call. That's the strategy yeah. or Walmart call. That's the order. That's the strategy. Open up a new line in the next garage over um, or all of the other reflexive things we do to chase the dollars. And we think when the dollars are coming in, the marketplace is rewarding us. Right. That are back. We think we're, we're scaling. And the dangerous thing for most small businesses, Chris, is that they confuse growth with scale. Mm, interesting. It's two, Explain that a bit. They're two very different things. Well, growth means my top line is getting bigger, but, but it often means my cost is getting bigger with it. Uh, scale means I'm, I'm gaining efficiencies. I'm gaining um, economies of, of scale. I'm ability to, I'm ability to replicate uh, activities for less cost. Mm. Um, I'm standardizing processes. I'm standardizing approaches. I'm standardizing messaging. I'm actually creating an organization and separating out my most competitive work from just the work that everybody has to do. Yeah. Um, and, and mostly what you walk in and see in small companies when there's you know, just 20, 30, 100 people is mayhem, right? You see right. everybody running around, jacks of all trades, hair on fire, um, yeah. the, you feel the seam stip- riching, <laughs> ripping out the faces, <laughs> the G-force is hitting them all. And people always say, wow, they thrive. I thrive in that. No, most people don't thrive in that environment at all. They hate it. Yeah. Um, sure, they think it's better than the soul-sucking, de- you know, killing environment of a big company where I'm invisible and don't matter. Um, but not a lot <laughs> uh, better because you come, you come, you leave home, work exhausted every day. And you're not sure what you did that mattered. Right. Right. And so you know, strategy, organization, and leadership are the three fundamentals that entrepreneurs 
have to get right. And they're so busy working in the business. They don't take the time to step out and work on the business. Yeah. Yeah. It's a new, it's a new discipline. They have to step back and make themselves work on the business. Um, zoom out and think about it from a, where does I want to go? But most often they're so busy trying to keep the lights on that day, make payroll that week, um, fill the orders that month. Um, that, they can't ever step back and say, where's this? Is this going someplace I want it to go? Mm. Is this what I, is this what I signed up for? Um, and on in flush weeks where you made a lot of money or you got a bonus or people were happy or a cust- customer high five you, you think, wow, it's great. But on weeks you, not, you cash is running thin or the phone's not ringing or the, the, you know, the, 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 um, the dialogue box on your website contact form is not returning inquiries. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the crickets are chirping or, you know, yeah, you know, sure. Great. Today I have time to go put the dry cleaning in. Yeah. But you know, it's, it, that you can write it off to the feast or famine reality of small business. But the question you have to ask yourself is, is this having a, are you on a trajectory you want to be on that you're controlling um, for the next three to five years? Are you headed for a place you want to be at bigger than you're at today? Yeah. Or do you, on a scale do you just want to you know are you good to go yeah and it, do you have any uh t- you know tips or tactics uh that enable the entrepreneur to keep that in sight because i agree with you it is so hard i mean uh, i from my own vantage point i mean i made the big leap last year and uh uh you know as uh christmas started to unfold i started to look at my new year and i had a vision for what i wanted to achieve but here i am now in in late february and i notice the you know uh, the more days than in the first of the year uh you know i'm i'm kind of running on adrenaline just trying to uh, to get things done right so i i can reflect on my journey and and agree with you i'm probably a great example of someone losing sight at times uh to the big vision i created uh for the business you know yeah yeah any any ideas as to how to stay focused on that well it's i mean you have to first of all um you have to want to, right? Yeah. You have to, most leaders, they, they're a great technician. They're a great, they have some technology. They love that work and stepping back and becoming the, the architect of the future, the, the organizational scientists, the strategic strategy scientists, they don't like that work or they haven't been trained to do it. And so you have to build your own appetite to do that work and mm. accept it's very different work, right? You go in, you go into work that day. There's, hundred e- e- emails in your inbox, the phone is ringing or an employee calls in sick. You got to sub in a uh, client calls and their website's down. They're pissed. Um, or uh, you have 18 tickets on the engineer's desk on the help desk and the clients are angry, you know, th- whatever it is, yeah. you feel like I'm the guy that's got to dive in. It's my name's on the building. Yeah. Right. And there's some dangerous partial truth to that. But if you don't, for goodness sake, put a Chinese wall there and say, I've got to find a way to work on this business yeah. and you know, almost be an outsider, be an anthropologist to it and yeah. ask myself. And, and the first thing I could do is you have to get data. You have yeah. to, you know, you would not go into a cardiologist and say, I'm having a, some pain right here. And the cardiologist would say, Oh yeah, no, that's the upper uh, ventricle valve clogged. Come on. I just, I'm going to stick a stent in right now. <laughs> exactly. I, I've seen it a million times. I know what it is. Yeah. We're not going to do like an MRI. No, 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 no. I, I trust me. You'd run, right? Yeah. Why, for goodness sake, with your own baby, would you see symptoms and rec- not recognize symptoms of problems and not get data, right? Mm. Not get your MRI. Find out, you know, it, it, honestly, are my clients saying, am I, are they buying what I'm selling? That's another mm. big one, right? You find out that the thing, the value that I think I'm creating is that the value they're paying for. Yeah, exactly. I think I'm selling a service. They're buying convenience. Yeah. I think I'm selling a product. They're buying a, an aspirin. Mm. Right. And so if you don't know what value you created for them, then you haven't differentiated yourself. Yeah, exactly. I fully appreciate that for many entrepreneurs in early days, sometimes you're still figuring that out, but it's here. It's not here. Right. No. Right. And um, you have to ask yourself what capabilities that differentiate me? Where am I investing disproportionately in those? How am I going to organize the work and separate the competitive work that makes me special 
and protect it from the necessary work that keeps the lights on. Because once you mix those together and the same person is doing the invoicing, is doing the, that's doing the technology, everything's diluted, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Keep that work separated. Um, and I'm constantly evolving and improving that's that, the ability of that machine to grow and deliver the promise I've made. Yeah. That's your most important job. Yeah. If you're too busy executing it, if you're too busy putting a fire out, if you're too busy, you know, taking those calls, um, to never do that work, don't expect the marketplace to reward you automatically just because they love you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I fully agree with you. Um, so, uh, a couple of books come to mind that as I've been listening to you there, start with why by Simon Sinek. I'm sure that's one that you've, uh, you, you know, and, and cause I, I, what I heard you there saying was that, uh, and the key phrase from that book that resonates with me as it relates to uh, what you're saying there is that people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it, you know? And, uh, so I think, as companies, we need to we need to understand why we're doing it and be able to reflect the uh, uh, you know uh, put that out into the marketplace and have our customers feel that you know. And uh, the other one, I don't know if you've read uh, the uh, the one thing by Gary Keller. Uh, it's a it's a phenomenal book. Uh, and really, I think what what I feel you're saying is that we as entrepreneurs need to be very focused for a certain component of every day or every week anyway on the one thing. Which in in what you're saying there, it's on the master vision we have for our businesses, you know? And um, so two points I'd add to that, Chris. One is um, if we are not telling the clients why we're doing something, they're going to make up a reason. Yeah. It's going to be why they're buying it um, or why they think, why they think they're buying it. Mm. Um, and it may not match. Right. And then, yeah. now you have dilution. Um, secondly, a vision and a vision statement are two different things. Mm. Um, and often I, you just sort of, you know, uh, I, we have to have it for the, for the series B funding term sheet. So write something down. We will be the preeminent provider. Uh, we, we will be the Uber of, uh, <laughs> right? um, we, you know, people will run to their mailboxes to get their bills because they still love doing it. Our internet services will be never go down and we'll always pick up the phone. You, you get that. It sounds like yeah. you Googled it. Yeah, exactly. But it's not who you are. Mm. And I tell clients when I do strategy work with them, is we're going to figure out the fundamentals of your strategy, but you're going to take one year to earn your right to write down your mission statement. Mm, I like you're going to that. live it first. You're going to embody it first. It's going to reveal itself to you, and then you can write it down. But if you're struggling, and if, you know they all become wordsmithing parties. I don't like the word being. I'd rather like the word presence. <laughs> and you're sitting there watching this team of people you know, who are taking in millions of dollars of work trying to get more, and you hear these things and they, and they believe they're being passionate about the vision. You're thinking, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's what they think visioning or missioning is. is yeah. A statement. Um, and it's not. No, it's, exactly. You live it and embody it. And you know, the best authors of your vision or mission are your customers. Customers. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. If, if they're watching you live it, they're going to tell you what you stand for. They're going to tell you what path you're on and why they'll pay for it. Mm. Um, and if, if you have never gone out and asked your clients, why do you do business with me? Um, and I don't mean some cheap survey monkey survey. I mean, go talk to them and ask talk them, them. What, yeah. what, what'd you come to my door for and why do you stay? Yeah, exactly. And, or have somebody else go ask them. So they'll tell them, really tell the truth. Yeah. And what could we do better? Where, where are we not delivering that? You know, what, what would wow you beyond belief and get their voices in mm. the mix. You're just, you know, uh, off on your own, in your own self-serving way and not, uh, not in reality. You're just yeah. creating your own world. Exactly. So I understand you recently uh, authored, I know you're the author of a number of books. What is it? Eight, I think, uh, is yeah. what I read. Yeah. And, and so have they been all published and, and uh, out there in the marketplace still for sale, all eight of them? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so wow. a couple of the older ones are um, you can get on Amazon used or out of print, but but yeah, um, but the most recent one was Rising to Power. Yeah, we uh, it's a ten year study of those trying to transition into bigger jobs of more of more influence, uh, and um, you know it began with a personal experience of a, of a leader in an organization we work with was extraordinarily promising and talented getting fired. 
Mm. Um, and it made no sense. Why? How could we have misjudged um, somebody that, by all mean, by all accounts, should have had a phenomenal runway? Um, so we went in to investigate what happened, and that led to a ten-year longitudinal study, more than twenty-seven hundred people, to find out why is it that fifty percent of those that take on bigger jobs and companies um, um, fail within yeah. their first eighteen months, um, and um, it made no sense to us. Well, it turns yeah. out it's a wonder any of them succeed when um, when uh, the, the landmines that get put in their way. Yeah. Right? So we wanted to find out what it was that sets apart those that are succeeding. Uh, and that's what we did. So that was a, it was an exciting project. And what would you suggest the, is the key character, the key elements of those that are being successful versus those that are not? Uh, so there were four. Um, that was the nice part about the research. It, it, the, the, the same four recurring patterns kept repeating themselves. In fact, um, we, we did, I had those researchers do 99 regression analyses um, on the data because the, no matter how we cut it, looked at it, the same four kept coming apart. But, but the issue was the people on that side of the ledger were good at all four of them. And I didn't want to have to say that. I can't say three out of four. Like what, what if they're just okay at one and get, they're like, Ron, it's not going to change. Stop. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the reality was that that's why the failure rates are so high. It takes the bars high. Mm. They were, so there were four. The great news was this wasn't some mystical pill they took or some magical DNA. You know, there, you can learn them all. I've got a, um, a, an HBR live video. People, you can put in your show notes. I've got a, a new Ted talk out. Yep. Well, you can put on, on these four, you can put in your show notes. Yeah. So, okay. I got the links here. Um, you can get them, get them up there for folks, but uh, they were breadth. So seeing the whole story. So this is what we just been talking about, right? You have to yep. step in and see how the pieces of your organization fit together. Problems in organizations and value credit in organizations happens at the seams. It's where social media, digital marketing and selling come together. Come together. It's where supply chain, manufacturing and innovation come together. It's at the mm -hmm. intersections. Leaders who rise up have to stitch those seams. Right. They can't. And too many of the failed leaders were so focused on one piece that they actually made the division worse. Uh, the second one was context. So these were the leaders that could read tea leaves. They could they could read the landscape. They saw trends coming at them. They anticipated change. Um, they didn't just slap on their solutions um, with, with some mythical mandate of I'm here to fix everything. They understood that they had to adapt themselves to the context as much as they had to change it. And the context had as much to change in them as they had to change in it. There was, was choice. These are the leaders that could make really hard decisions. So for too many leaders, um, they want to please people. They want to buy popularity. They want to win loyalty. So they say yes way too much. And in so doing, especially for entrepreneurs, they dilute focus. Mm. Right? They, everybody's gotten one too many yeses. And now I don't even know who I am. They're all doing their own thing. Yeah. But to narrow the focus of your team is one of the greatest gifts you can give them, even if it means disappointing them, even if it means saying no to great ideas so that other great ideas can prevail. For too many leaders, the construction of those choices was too hard. Mm. Um, and then lastly, not surprisingly, was connection. The kinds of relationships these people had of deep trust and credibility with peers, with bosses, with direct reports, with customers. Um, these were the people, you know, and we all see them, Chris, right? These are people, everybody wants to be around them. Yeah, that we love them. They're kind. They're nice. I want to touch the the shirt and get yeah. get some of that. <laughs> um, but the biggest distinguisher was they built their stakeholder maps. They they, they their relationship or priorities were not those they could get something from, mm. but it was those they could help succeed. They yeah. put out of their way to put an in, in invested uh, relational equity into people they could drive success for, and people mm. knew that. So you can see four things really hard to do any one of them doing four of them. Well, look, not a low bar, um, yeah. but it can be done. And when you do them, that's when your impact on the world, that's when your business, that's when your organization really takes off. Yeah. And would you say, uh, because yeah, you know, I've, I've worked in corporate, uh, you know, and those that are successful, they seem to be very self-aware and confident uh, versus the, those that don't succeed. 
they have that they lack that self awareness you know the ability to see those elements that you're referring to there and work on them on an ongoing basis or or would you suggest uh the f- people that are successful it kind of just happens naturally for them or is it a work in process that was the the great thing about the research chris was none of these four things happened in with some mysterious form right if you look back in the careers of these leaders these are, are you can learn context by reading strategy by yeah. By understanding what's happening in your industry, by asking, be, be, being curious, by wondering yeah. why, why is it that way? You can learn breadth by crossing borders. Don't start a border war in your organization. Cross the border. Go into someone else's world and see what's it like for market. If you're in marketing, what's it like for sales to work with you? Yeah. If you're in supply chain, what's it like for manufacturing to work with you? If you're in social media, what's it like for digital content to work with you? And, and, and learn how to cross seams. You can learn decision-making by understanding what, you know, how, do, how do you intuitively make decisions? What data do you collect? What data do you dismiss? Whose voices do you include? You can learn to construct hard choices and you can learn to win the respect of people by saying no. Yeah. And you can invest in great relationships. You can simply ask yourself, who today uh, in my community, in my organization, in my team, my family relies on me to be successful? And what am I doing to let them know how committed I am to their success? You can prioritize your relationships today. So these are four things you can begin learning earlier in your, in your career. Yeah, if absolutely. You wait, if you wait till your first vice president assignment to begin building those muscles, that's not a good idea. Because now you're exposed. Yeah. Now you, your life is now playing out on the jumbotron. Um, you have a megaphone strapped to your mouth. Everything you say is amplified. This is not the time to start learning those things. You know, no. people say, well, they must've got there for some reason. Sure. But sometimes the reason wasn't a good one. Yeah. Uh, and sure. Do they probably have some of those things? Sure. But like the guy I, I told you that began my study, he was brilliant. He was a great guy, but his failure was context. He mm. didn't read the He was there. He thought he had some mandate to create change. He thought he was being diligent and he kept, you know, and, he, and his idea was right. But he was imposing it in a way that people just backed off. They yeah. thought, oh, he used to be a great guy. Now he's a jerk. He wasn't <laughs> a jerk at all. He just didn't, nobody told him, hey, hey, there's a better way to get this idea through. Yeah, I love it. That's, uh, yeah, I got to get your book. I'm going to have to re- uh, pick that one up right away because it sounds like a phenomenal uh, uh, book. Um, and I would, uh, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking about it through the lens of, sales, uh, B2B salespeople or entrepreneurs that are looking to get into uh, to, uh, organizations and sell their uh, offering. And the four you've identified, I, I believe, uh, are the same four pillars that enable that uh, in, in yep. terms of sales, right? Well, especially if you're getting to a, if you're a smaller business trying to sell to a bigger business, you think, oh, I'm the small fish. I'm an advantage to you because I'm more nimble and I'm hungrier. Sometimes that's true. Yeah. But Again, if you don't know how what you're creating, what you're selling fits into their story, and so often they don't, no. right? I, I attach to the marketing guy, I attach to the you know the manufacturing guy, I attach to the IT guy, but who do they have to influence? Yeah. How is what they're getting from you going to fit to help them? Exactly. If you don't know the you know working with a startup that's uh, into the technology storage business, right? And it's about and the, and the solution that they got Series B money, they're a great little company. Um, and uh, it's easy access to broad platforms of data. And my question then was, what are they going to do with the data? You've made it easily to access, easily to access for them. Great. Now what? If they can't analyze it, if they can't bring together financial, human resources, market, customer data, and make great decisions with it because they don't know how, guess who they're going to blame? Absolutely. It was a waste of money. <laughs> so, but you're creating a brilliant technology platform that really changes you know, the, a secure ability to integrate data platforms. Mm. Super. Mm. Are you, th- even if it's not you that does it, are you asking the question, are we sure that when they access that information, it makes them smarter? Right. Better decision makers, makes them more focused. Otherwise, it's a library. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a very yeah. different question. Yeah, yeah. You're nailing uh, the aspects of really what is ultimately strategic selling or complex selling. And, you know, and, and I find entrepreneurs or small businesses, they fail to look at 
selling into larger organizations through the vantage point that number one, what you've identified, there's, per, uh, there's personal buying motivations that individuals have that you know, unless you get to know these individuals and you ask the right questions, you're, you'll never, you'll never get to them. And just being aware that there's personal buying motivations. And um, as well, then on top of that, realizing that in large organizations, uh, the, the buying decision is, can be quite complex. It's usually not a one person decision. It's a, you have economic buyers, you have, uh, have technical buyers, you have users, you have uh, uh, different types of people with different motivations that you have to try to surround yourself uh, with. Uh, so it's important, and, I think, for entrepreneurs to realize that. And you know what, Chris, too often they, it's the price play, right? You know, I'm small, I'm hungrier, I'm going to serve you better. It's an RFP process so that you're, you're 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 in the, you're in the finalist of the bake off yeah. right you're in the final 3 you you're now doing the swimsuit competition and there you are right and the reality is you think you know they gouge you on price they, they you think i we want this business with this big company because it's going to be this long annuity so let's take the price hit now as a loss leader and get in there that's sometimes that works out sometimes it doesn't no exactly but if you don't know if you don't know enough about who you are to know why you would make that decision for that organization you, you're gonna you're gonna chase the dollars and yeah. be careful what you wish for because you might win yeah yeah and likely lose in the long time and long run yourself as a company uh ron this has been amazing uh, your passion for the subject and uh, uh is very clear and uh how can people watching or listening uh learn more from you get to uh, you know what what what's your give us your elevator pitch i suppose as to uh how uh, companies can take advantage of your services yeah, I'd love to keep the conversation going. So come to our website and hang out. We've got lots of great conversations and content happening there at www.navalent, N-A-V-A-L-E-N-T.com. A um, couple of things uh, folks should know. Next week, we're launching an amazing virtual summit called Leading Through Turbulence. Okay. And we it starts March 5th through 9th. It's free for the week. Or you, uh, This week, we're running a special. You can get an all one-year access pass for 199 bucks. We, we, we sold a bunch of them at $2.99. We started to run a special for this week, President's Day. Yeah. Uh, with that, you get um, a, a private consultation on your own change initiative with an Avalid partner. You get um, a free ebook on leading transformation. You get a year of curated content and curated conversation. You get some personal debriefs from the summit. And you get 25 amazing conversations with people like Dan Pick, Dory Clark, John Haidt, Len Schlesinger from Harvard. Um, Whitney Johnson, uh, Mark, wow. Cooley, um, CEOs of schoolers, CEOs of Coronal Energy, CEOs of big companies, um, an amazing collection of, of people's voices who've been there in the trenches leading turbulent change successfully. Yeah. It's a great course in leading change. And what um, did you say the price was? 199 bucks. Oh this my God. Week, right now, go get the pass. <laughs> it's, and it's free. If you want to come to, and watch the videos next week, they're going to be each day. They'll be available for 24 hours. Watch them next week, but go on our website. Uh, at com. right at the top. You'll see the, the button for that um, and go register. Yeah. I'll put it in the comments and I'll also put it in the show notes. That's a phenomenal value. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this, yeah, Ron, this I, has been awesome. At Twitter, at Ron Carucci, and I'm also at LinkedIn, so come keep the conversation going. Yeah, and maybe I'll just spe spell your last name for uh, people that are listening. Ron Arrowin, obviously, uh, C-A-R-U-C-C-I. Uh, there you go. All right. Thanks so much, Ron. I really appreciate your time. It was great to be with you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to the It's Time to Sell podcast at chrisspurvey.com.